Well, good morning. Welcome to worship here at University Park United Methodist Church on this third Sunday after Pentecost. Like I said last Sunday, in the Christian calendar, these late spring and summer worship services are devoted to reflection on how we practice our faith in the real world. It turns out there are lots and lots of right answers to that question, and today we're going to be reflecting on a few of them. I want to thank Carol Bedeen for the week, this week's flowers that are decorating our table in the worship service. She's given them in honor of her parents, Frank and Joanne Madrin. If you'd like to sponsor flowers for worship in honor or in memory of a loved one or a significant event in your life or just because you like flowers, let us know. Let me know or let somebody on the staff know and we'll make that happen. I also want to continue to acknowledge our wonderful gardening crew who's been working very hard in the courtyard and around the premises. Suzanne Livingston, Amy William, or Amy Wilson, rather, Rick Stearns, Nancy Gwynn, Barb Phillip, John Stidman, Rodney Brown was out there this morning. Kathy Dunwoody was there. Lots of people who have continued their work this week. The trees are being trimmed. The the tree trimmage is being hauled away. The courtyard looks terrific. The grounds look wonderful. And I want to thank everybody who's participated in keeping the church so beautiful. Thank you very much. If, if this is your first time worshiping with us, or if it's your first time in a long time, I do want to extend a special welcome to you. If you're joining us on Facebook or on YouTube today, we're delighted to have you with us, and I hope that soon you'll worship with us here in our sanctuary. University Park United Methodist Church is an open and affirming congregation. Our vision for ministry here is to be an intergenerational, diverse, radically inclusive Christian community where families and individuals of all kinds can thrive. So whoever you are, whatever you may believe or question or doubt, you are welcome here at University Park United Methodist Church. I'm going to be in the lobby after worship. If you'd like to know more about the church or you just want to stop and say hi, I'd love to talk with you. Leora Bennett is our guest musician this morning. Leora, would you stand? Leora is a cellist and an oboist who performs around Denver and who is also the founder of the Denver Chamber Consort, which is a nonprofit chamber music organization that produces concerts throughout the Front Range. I'm very delighted to have Leora with us today. Yeah, we can clap. <laughs> I also want to remind us that as part of our strategic planning process, we're asking everyone in the congregation to respond to a short survey that we sent out by email, and that is available in hard copy and paper versions there on the back table in the lobby. We've gotten almost 80 responses so far, which is terrific. We're shooting for 100 to give us a really solid sample of the congregation's thinking, so we've kept the survey open for a few more weeks. If you have sent in a response, I want to thank you. This is going to help us develop our plans for ministry over the next few years. And if you would like to fill one of those out today, like I said, there's a small stack of them on the back table in the lobby, or you can fill them out online. If you're going to fill out a paper copy, you can give that to me or any of the staff, or just fold it in half and drop it on the back table, and we'll pick it up. All responses are anonymous, and everybody's input is valuable, so it'll really help us out if you do this. As we begin our time together this morning, please do take just a moment. Let us know you're here by jotting down your name on one of the attendance pads that you'll find in your pews. This helps us know who's at which service, and if you'd like to be on our newsletter mailing list or to receive other communications from the church, you can include your email address as well. Lauren Cowden is our youth ministry director here at U Park, and so I want to invite Lauren forward to tell us about a few things coming up in the life of our church. Good morning. God is good. And all the time. Amen. We have several events happening in the life of our church. First, our summer softball season has begun. Today, U Park will have two games, the first one at 115 and the second one at 245. All games are played at Progress Park. If you're interested in joining the team or just looking for more information, you can get in touch with Larry Rogensack. Next, our Vacation Bible School starts tomorrow. I am so excited. This year's theme is Discovery on Adventure Island. We will be meeting Monday through Friday, beginning in the jungle, which is Wasser Chapel, and then ending at noon. If you want to join the Vacation Bible School team as a volunteer or have a kid that's interested, it's not too late to sign up. So we hope to see you sometime next week, or this week, rather. 
If you're wondering why there's toilet paper all over our lobby, we have been collaborating with Metro Caring and hosting a toilet paper drive to support the services that they provide. If you would like to participate in the toilet paper drive or just have some toilet paper laying around, you can bring it in and put it with the rest of the toilet paper that's stacking up in the lobby. We are extending this drive through. It's a perpetual drive, so there is no deadline to bring in the toilet paper if you want to participate. Mark your calendars on June 22nd at 10 a.m. Dorothy Logger's family will be having a celebration of life. Um, this celebration will be at the Highline Community Church in Greenwood Village. Um, if you plan on attending, please do tell either one of the staff so we can get that RSVP to her family. For all other events happening in the life of our church, please do check out our flat screen TVs located in the lobby. You could take a look at any one of the bulletin boards throughout the church, or you can get signed up for our weekly newsletter that comes out every Monday. Now, in this time of the service, I'm going to ask you to stand as you are able and greet your neighbors by passing the peace of Christ. Please stand as you are able for the call to worship. As the sun rises in the morning, as the cool breeze ushers in the evening, as the heat of the noonday sun spreads across the land, God is present with us here in our worship and in each day. Thanks be to God.
This morning's scripture reading is from the first book of Samuel, chapter 8, um, verses 4 through 5 and 10 through 20. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us, then, a king to govern us like other nations. So Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He will make one-tenth or take one-tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and his courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks, and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, No, but we are determined to have a king over us so that we may also may be like other nations and that our king may govern us, govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. May God bless the hearing and understanding of these words. So ordinarily, I might call this the beginning of a sermon series, but actually it's only two sermons because after next Sunday, I'm going to annual conference and then Gayla and I are going to be away on vacation. So I won't be here on the 23rd, the 30th or the 7th. So let's just call this part one of a two part sermon. Let's pray together. God of beauty and new creation. It is so easy on days when we see around us the beauty of green trees and brightly colored flowers and blue sky and warmth. It is so easy to remember that we live in your creation. May our gathering here in this community of faith, turning toward you, open our minds and our hearts to that same truth. And may each of us hear the word that you would speak to us this day. 
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, I really hope it won't surprise you when I say that I've got a pretty broad view of what it means to be Christian. I don't like to insult people's faith. I don't like to tell people they're doing it wrong. That sort of feels to me like spiritual bad manners of the worst sort. I don't think any of us get Christianity 100% right. You know, we try. We learn as we go. We're all doing the best we can. And I think one of the purposes of church, actually, is to be this community where we can learn together and practice together what it means to be Christian. So I think if you are trying to be a follower of Jesus, you are a follower of Jesus, even though, like all of us, you're probably making some mistakes along the way. There's a prayer that I have always loved. It's attributed to the monk and author Thomas Merton. Merton writes, My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following you does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does, in fact, please you. And I hope that I have that desire in all that I do. I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. I love that prayer because it speaks to what I think is an appropriate humility and an appropriate attitude to take in our exploration toward God, in our spiritual growth, our spiritual life. One of the keystones of my faith is the belief that if I aim, if I intend day by day, hour by hour to live by the example of Christ, if I'm trying to do that, then God will lead me even like Merton says, when I don't know where I'm going and I don't understand what God is doing, which is most of the time. I believe that God is faithful to us. And to use another Merton saying, with God, a little sincerity goes a long way. Now, because we don't know the mind of God, I do think that we can be both Christian, in the sense of genuinely trying to follow Jesus, and wrong in the sense that we're mistaken about how, we're mistaken about what that means. Here's an example. We just had this split in the Methodist church. I don't know, maybe you heard about it. Now, we were really fighting about big questions like, what's the relationship of church to the culture around us? What's the nature of biblical authority? What's the role of conscience when it comes to obeying or disobeying church rules that we disagree with? Those are underlying issues that we were really fighting about, but it all came to a head over this question of LGBTQIA people being fully included in the life of the church. And I believe that the people who oppose inclusion, the people who left the denomination over it, I believe they're Christian. I know some of those people. I think they are really committed to following Jesus. I just think that when it comes to the question of inclusion, they're wrong. And of course, that's what they think about me, to be fair. This goes back to that question of the role of conscience. We have to do what we think is right. We have to do what we believe God is calling us to do and hope that God will work through us so that we can make it all or God can make it all work out in the end. Now in the Bible passage we just heard this morning, we're at this point in the story where the people of Israel have been in the promised land for several hundred years and they have been led during that time by kind of warrior heroes who the Bible calls judges even though they're nothing like judges in our society. They're not making legal rulings. Maybe over the years, if you've hung around churches much or read the Bible much, you've heard some of these names, names like Joshua, Samson, Gideon, people like that. And for 40 years or so, Samuel has been one of those leaders. But as we heard in the story, Samuel's aging. He tries to put his sons in charge to take his place, but that doesn't go well. So the people come to Samuel and they ask him to appoint a king to rule over them. Now, this is not a surprising request at all, because the people are straight up scared. 
They are surrounded by tribes with huge standing armies ruled by kings who have enormous wealth, who can support military campaigns for years on end. It is the late Bronze Age at this point in the story, so Israel's enemies have all the most advanced weapons technology. They got chariots, they got bows, they got big spears, big sharp swords, the best armor the world has ever made. Israel, on the other hand, has no standing army. They don't have any of this. They've never had a king. Their leader is a frail prophet nearing the end of his life. But Samuel tells them if they exercise power like all the nations around them exercise power, they will regret it. He tries to warn them. Their king, he tells them, will be corrupted by power as kings inevitably are. After escaping slavery in Egypt, they're going to become slaves again, this time by their own choosing. Samuel is telling them that they are the people of God, and as the people of God, they're supposed to do things differently. But their fear speaks louder than Samuel's wisdom. They're trying to be the people of God. They're just doing it wrong, and Samuel cannot talk them out of it. Now, in the end, of course, to no one's surprise, Samuel is correct. Saul, Israel's first king, slowly becomes paranoid and power-mad and delusional and murderous. David, the next king, abuses his power. David's son Solomon expands the kingdom, but he ends up so focused on his own wealth and power that he builds temples to foreign gods. And after his death, the kingdom splits and breaks up from within. By the time Jesus is born, maybe a thousand years or so later, Israel is a minor power at best, ruled by one empire after another. They're trying to be the people of God, but by the time Jesus comes on the scene, they can't even agree on what that means. Now see, I think, like a lot of biblical stories, I think this passage from 1 Samuel was included in Scripture not because it has answers, clear, concrete prescriptions for us to follow, I think it was included because it raises questions that are just as important now as they were 3,000 years ago when this story was first written down. We live in scary times, and it is easy to be driven by fear. As a matter of fact, there are voices every single day screaming in our ears telling us what to be afraid of and why we should give in to them. Climate change and environmental destruction are driving catastrophic weather events and mass migration. Global power dynamics are shifting. Agricultural yields are decreasing. Fisheries are dying. Epidemiologists tell us that we may see another pandemic in the next few decades. In global surveys, global surveys, increasing numbers of young people, so people coming up now, people who are young adults, report they no longer trust democracy or capitalism. More people every year throughout the entire world are openly backing some form of fascism as a way of dealing with all this. So I think the question Samuel raises for us, I don't think it's so simple as will we trust God or will we trust humans? I think that's simplistic. I mean, after all, the ancient judges were all human. It seems to me the real question for people of faith is what does faithfully exercised power look like? How do we use whatever influence we may have in ways that are consistent with being followers of Jesus? Now, I want to offer you a couple of different answers, a couple of extreme ways to answer that question, kind of two ends of the spectrum. One is what's often called Christian nationalism. Now, that term means a whole lot of different things, but at its heart is this idea that there should be no separation between church and state, that theologically conservative Christians should take control of our government, our entertainment, our family life, our religious practice, our educational system, our media, our arts and entertainment, and our sectors of business. Now, if you're wondering why I'm being so specific about these things that Christians are supposed to control, this is an actual fully articulated theory it's called the Seven Mountains Mandate, and it was first cooked up in the 1970s or so. Those of you who were part of our Revelation study a few months ago will recognize that the people who created this idea intentionally took the term from the book of Revelation. 
People who back this notion believe that this is how Christians should exercise power, by taking control of this country. Now, I want to be clear about two things. First, the Seven Mountains Mandate is, like I said, it's one extreme. I know lots of theologically and politically conservative Christians who don't believe this stuff at all. But the second thing I want to make clear is that there are a significant number of people who do. There are citizens of the United States who firmly believe in what we might call a Christian fundamentalist theocracy and who are working very hard to create it. In that world, LGBT inclusion is not even a question. Religious freedom is not even a question. Cultural diversity is not even a question. People who disagree with a particular version of theologically conservative Christianity are simply treated as wrong and marginalized or disenfranchised or worse. So that's one answer to the question of how people of faith should use our power, our influence. It is, like I said, an extreme version. But the basic idea is that Christians should fight to gain and hold power in exactly the same way as everybody else. Which brings us back to the beginning of this sermon. I think, and you know, this is just me talking here, okay? But I think the people who believe that stuff, I think they're absolutely Christian. They want to be followers of Christ. I just think, personally, they're wrong. They're equating loyalty to the United States with loyalty to God, but those are two very different things. And besides, theocracies, let's face it, have a terrible track record. Just ask anybody who found themselves, you know, burned at the stake in the Middle Ages for questioning the doctrine of the church, or ask anybody who lives in Iran or Afghanistan right now what they think of the true believers who are leading their government. Now, you will have to ask them in private because they're probably going to be too afraid to give you a public answer. Ask the 4th and 5th century monks who saw Christianity become a tool of Roman imperial power. Or we could just ask Samuel, who knew that power corrupts, that people in power are almost always willing to do whatever it takes to hold and increase their power. Now, there's an opposite extreme, of course. The opposite extreme is to say that Christianity is spiritual, not worldly, and we should have nothing to do with trying to exert influence on politics or culture or anything outside of our faith. We should worship together, pray together, study scripture together, but hold ourselves apart from the rest of society. And for centuries, for centuries, there have been Christians who absolutely believed that and tried to practice it. Now, I think I could learn a lot from these folks, but in the end, personally, I cannot accept that answer either. Jesus, it seems to me, spends way too much time calling out the unjust powers of his world. He doesn't hide away, focus just on prayer, refuse to get involved. Jesus was crucified because the Roman imperial leaders and the temple leadership saw him as a threat to their power. In the end, I think there is a very different solution, a truly faithful way of using our power. I think it's one that Jesus himself proposed, and as he so often does, he used a parable, one of these delightful, mysterious, paradoxical little teaching stories to describe it. So here's the cliffhanger part. Next week, I want to continue this sermon by talking about a gentle and slow, but I believe ultimately irresistible way of faithfully using the influence we do have to let God work through us, to let God transform the world, to let God use us for purposes that we may not even fully understand. Let me invite us into a few moments of silence. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Throughout the past few months, every month we take a little time to talk about an effort that we're calling Engage Ministry. It's the opportunity for people new to the church or for people who've been here for a long time to find ways to serve and deepen your involvement here in the ministries of this church. I want to invite Rick Stearns forward to tell us a little bit about his involvement in the church beyond Sunday worship. Thanks, Andy. Uh, again, I, I'd just like to share with you my thoughts and experiences and feelings that I have, uh, uh, that I have about uh, church involvement outside of the Sunday worship. Um, I happen to be involved in four different uh, programs. Um, I'm, I'm part of a, uh, a book club called uh, Psalms, Poetry, and Seinfeld that meets every Thursday. Um, we uh, analyze various religious subjects written in books and we share life experiences and uh, uh, and also discuss current events uh, on friday um, i participate in a bible study that is led by pastor andy dunning um, where we discuss the scripture that is um, going to be um, um, discussed at, at the at the sermon and we get into more details about that scripture. It's a very uh, meaningful um, thing to understand and, and to get to know how the Bible is uh, interconnected and in things. Uh, I'm also a member of the finance committee that meets monthly and where we um, review audit reports, to derive budgets, and discuss financial results. And then uh, the, finally, um, I do partake in uh, the gardener group where uh, we perform various yard works around this beautiful church. And uh, so those are the things that I'm doing. I, I feel that I get a lot out of those, so much more than what I put in. Um, and uh, it, it provides an opportunity to associate with some really good people who make up our congregation. It also you know, provides these uh, services that are needed and it, it serves to strengthen my understanding of the Bible and to uh, build my own faith. So anyway, I, I would uh, encourage others to consider um, participating in, in some of these things, and there are others as well that the church does. That's, it's a very, uh, I think it's an excellent program, and uh, that's, thank you. If you're interested in ways to get involved, you'll, on the, the welcome table at the back of the lobby, you'll find a brochure that says Engage Ministry, and that has a list of all kinds of different ways that you can get involved in the ministry of the church. You can just fill that out and turn that into us if you're interested, or if you have any questions, I'm happy to, to answer them. Let me invite forward anybody who is participating in our Vacation Bible School this coming week, as well as anybody who's going on our youth mission trip, although I don't know that any of our youth are here. Lauren's going. Is Ryan, oh, Ryan, are you here? He's hiding out. <laughs> we, yeah, we should call him out anyway. Totally. Sorry, Ryan, you have to come out. Well, I'm really, Bethany, could I ask you to just come forward here and tell us a little bit about Vacation Bible School? Bethany Hader Krabs is our director of children's ministry and our director of congregational care. So this week, our explorers will be um, exploring Discovery, or sorry, Adventure Island. It's called Discovery on Adventure Island. And they'll be searching for God's great light and finding infinity lanterns throughout the week. And those infinity lanterns represent um, things about God's love that can never go out. So love, joy, truth, faith, hope. Should be a, a lot of fun this week. We ask for your prayers that everyone has a safe and fun time. And I think that's all I have to share for now. <laughs> Thank you. Lauren will be part of it. Barb Urban is part of the crafts. We're very grateful for your involvement there. And as I said, we also have youth going out on mission trips this coming week and in, in the weeks to come. And Lauren will be traveling with them. Do you want to say anything about mission trips? We Coloradans say La Vida, La yes. La Vida, Colorado. Um, and a couple weeks after that, we'll be going to Divide, Colorado. And then our last mission trip will be in Alamosa, and we'll be working with a nonprofit, Pablo Puente, down there. So we're really excited. We 
are going to see the sand dunes, which I've never seen before. So lots of good things coming um, in the weeks ahead. Thank you. Let's join in this invocation for our vacation Bible school volunteers and our missioners. Let's join together in the words on the screen. We celebrate you as ambassadors of this congregation, serving in ministry with those you will meet in your travels and with the children of our church through Vacation Bible School. Through our prayers, we will be united with you in your work. May God richly bless your labors. Thank you all for your work, for all that you're doing. Thank you. Let's have the ushers come forward to receive the morning offering. Let's pray together. God of grace and glory, everything we have, every moment of our lives, every breath and heartbeat is truly a gift from you. And so we are grateful for this opportunity to return to your use some of what you have given us, asking only for the courage, the wisdom, and the vision to use all that we have for the greater glory of your name and your kingdom. Amen. Let's join in our concluding hymn.
No one does Christianity perfectly. Everyone makes mistakes, but God is with us and God is faithful at every moment of every day to each one of us. Know that, go in peace, go in love, be the people of God.